Hi, everyone. This is the fifth lecture of week eight. Uh, again, you can listen to this as an audio. And again, please read Kogan and the biblical chapters, uh, especially for these weeks and following, okay, because the materials from them will appear on your quizzes, despite me not going over them in the videos. Okay. Um, in this lecture, we're, we are going to be discussing the first book of the Deuteronomistic history, the book of Joshua. Okay? And of course, the book of Joshua is named after the main character of that book, Joshua, who is described in the book of Numbers as Moses' assistant and protege. <clears throat> and according to the book of Joshua, it is this figure, instead of Moses, who is allowed to enter the promised land and who acts as the leader of the Israelite group as the group fights with and tries to dislocate the native groups who are already living in Canaan. So this book describes, in short, the conquest and settlement of the promised land of Canaan by Israel. And as such, it's a pretty fraught book. And indeed, some students find Joshua one of the most difficult texts in the Hebrew Bible because of the pro-colonial kind of pro-war fight, fight, fight message that you see emerge from this book. Right? The book of Joshua begins with the baton of leadership being passed from Moses, to, who has now died, to Joshua. Okay? As both God and the Israelite community in Joshua 1 is depicted as affirming the leadership transition. God tells Joshua in Joshua 1 verses 1 through 9 that God will be with him as he was with Moses and reminds Joshua to be strong and courageous. God's affirmation is seconded by the Israelite community in verses 16 through 18, um, who tell Joshua that they will listen to him as they did to Moses, which, I don't know, depending on how you read it, it's not really a good promise, right? Because, okay, whatever. Um, however, the true affirmation um, <clears throat> that Joshua is a true protege and leader in the line of Moses is evident by Joshua's portrayal uh, as a double or a twin of Moses doing the exact same thing that Moses, his teacher and uh, mentor did. Indeed, with Joshua, it's almost as if Moses never died, just kind of reemerged or continued in this new form of Joshua. Right? This likeness or similarity between Moses and Joshua is evident in the first five chapters of the book. In Joshua 1, as I just stated, Joshua is told by God and the community that they will treat him just like they treated Moses. Again, a rather dubious promise, okay? In Joshua 1 and 2, in a story that I will go back to in the next video, um, Joshua, like Moses, sends out spies to scope out the promised land. And then Joshua 3, Joshua redoes or repeats the sea crossing done by Moses earlier in Exodus. And I'm going to read this part aloud. So this is Joshua chapter 3, verse 7 and following. The Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel so that you, they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua the, uh, said to the Israelites, draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know that among you is the living God who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Hezerites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. Okay, now verse 14. And when the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. So when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the water flowing from above stood still, rising in a single heap off at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, while those flowing towards the sea of the Arabah, the, that sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho. While all, the, while all of Israel was crossing over on dry land, the people who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. So like Moses, we are told that Joshua too is able to split the waters, allowing the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as well as the people of Israel, pass through the River Jordan on dry ground. And again, um, notice how this splitting of water 
theme, right? I mean, we've seen this theme from the very beginnings of the biblical text, right? Where God is imagined as an ordering deity who shows off his powers by uh, mastering or warring against and defeating the chaotic waters of the ocean or the river by splitting it. As such, um, not only does this re-emphasize God's kind of original powers, right, um, over chaos, um, it also shows that Joshua, again, um, is going to be imagined as a new creation myth, okay? Um, now, in this case, this is about the creation of the Israelite nation on the promised land. Okay? It also, like I said, emphasizes the martial warlike aspect of Yahweh. Okay, God and Joshua is imagined frequently as a warrior um, who, as he battled the sea, is going to battle the native Canaanite people and defeat them for the Israelites. A second emphasis um, is also present in this text in Joshua. Uh, and this emphasis is, um, you know, more so in Joshua than anywhere else, the emphasis on the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, as I noted before, was a box filled with important trinkets like mana, the staff, okay, um, and which was envisioned either as a seat or a footstool of God, okay? <clears throat> in Joshua and uh, later in, um, <clears throat> sorry, in Joshua and later in 1 Samuel, the Ark will also be imagined as a kind of war palladium or symbol suggest suggestive of God's presence. The Ark will, uh, will um, also in Joshua, the Ark um, will kind of appear in Joshua. It will disappear in the book of Judges, reappear in Samuel. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> and eventually it will be stashed away in the temple and it will never be heard from or about again. Um, indeed, the closest we get to how uh, the Ark might have been used and what it may have looked like. Um, and I get lots of questions about the Ark because of the Indiana Jones stories. Okay, anyways, um, <clears throat> the closest we get to the Ark, again, uh, this kind of box that symbolizes um, either God's presence as a war palladium or symbol, um, or as a footstool or seat of God, really is by looking at the traditions of Ethiopian Jews um, who still use the Ark in their ceremonies. Um, and uh, what you see in that group is that, you know, the Ark is used in particular ceremonies and um, sometimes, the, you know, because it's a box, it like wears out, they'll just kind of make a new one, okay? Thus answering, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Okay. Um, <clears throat> anywho, um, so Joshua, like Moses, uh, splits the sea or the river. Joshua also, like Moses, will lead the Israelites um, also in the celebration of the Passover, okay? Moses celebrates the Passover in Exodus 12 in a text I did not discuss, while Joshua celebrates the Passover, again, miming Moses in Joshua 5, okay? <clears throat> okay, and so uh, this is what happens uh, to the Israelites to prepare for the celebration of Passover. This is found in Joshua 5, uh, verse 2 and following. At the time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint lives and circumcise the Israelites a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Isra Israelites at Gebeath Ha'araloth, or the hill of foreskins. Cute. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them, all the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the warriors who had died during the journey through the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people born on the journey through the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised verse 7, and so it was their children whom he raised up in their place uh, that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of all the nation was done, they remained in the, in the places in the camp until they had healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so the place is called Gilgal to this day. <clears throat> While the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on the very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes, and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Okay. Oddly, um, it seems that the Israelites, while in the midst of their travels in the desert, forgot to do, like, the one crucial thing that marked them as Israelite, that is, 
circumcise their baby boys, right? And as evident by the hemming and hawing of the text, you know, that the, you know, there's how many times it says circumcision. Uh, <clears throat> It seems that the, circum the lack of circumcision until this point seems to have been, been a big problem. Okay? As it's such a problem that the writer tries to kind of solve it by saying, no, 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 they were circumcised, but just to be careful, we're just going to do it again. Okay? Now, of course, if you think about this, I mean, can you circumcise somebody a second time? I mean, you really shouldn't try to do it, okay? So likely another writer came in and, and, and thought, well, that, that's not possible. How can you circumcise them again? I mean, so, you know, another writer maybe came in and sort of added in all this hemming and, and hawing. Oh, well, you know, they, it's, you know, like, it's, like, they were not circumcised because they were, like, new children born and the old people have a worse circumcised. I mean, but they died, you know. Um, so that's why they're not circumcised. Now, of course, this is not really explained, okay, why the Israelites haven't uh, been maintaining this important practice in the wilderness, nor does it explain um, how doing uh, so late, so late in the game, not on the eighth day, right, why that's okay, but apparently circumcision um, is needed uh, before entrance into the promised land and before the celebration of Passover, so better late than never, right? A lot of people think that circumcision because it becomes an important right only later, right? And, and so um, there's a kind of retro, you know, retroactivity going on here, okay? When it becomes very important, now the text has to be edited to make it fit, right? Um, the story not um, only tries to explain, not very well, I think, the lack of the practice of this very important right, but also provides a kind of false origin tale, false, you know, an etiology, um, of Gilgal, a place that means rolling, and which might have been an ancient Canaanite holy site with ancient stone edifices, like your Stonehenge now. Okay? Now, after the whole circumcision thing and the Passover, we find Joshua again redoing, repeating what Moses did earlier, this time repeating Moses's cause story at the burning bush. So really, I mean, Joshua is like the second Moses. Okay. So, and this uh, call uh, is found in Joshua 5, verse 13 and following. Once when Joshua was by Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you one of us or one of the adversaries? Which really, I mean, should you do that if you see a guy with a sword? And he replied, neither, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. Then he said to him, why do you command your servant? Uh, sorry, what do you command your servant, my Lord? And the commander of the army of the Lord said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy. And so Joshua did so. Here, Again, as with Moses, Joshua encounters a divine being, in this case, a kind of fighting or warrior angel, okay, who tells him to remove his sandals because he is standing on holy ground, just as Moses was told to do so in Exodus 3, when Moses encounters God or an angel, okay, in the form of a burning bush, okay. Again, um, maybe we're even supposed to imagine this angel that Joshua encounters as kind of burning, right, or shiny or fiery, just like the burning bush, as some angels we know are called the seraphim, um, seraph means to burn, okay, so maybe they were kind of fiery beings, I don't know. <clears throat> The sequence of events that Joshua undergoes in Joshua 1 through 5, the crossing of the sea, Passover, this divine call, notice that it not only mimics Israel, but does so in verse, right? With Moses, he got his call first, then the Passover, then the crossing of the sea. Joshua does the same thing, but like in a reverse sequence, okay? Of course, this is not the only thing <clears throat> that uh, Joshua mimics um, of Moses. Rather, Coogan lists, like in his chapter, um, in chapter 11 of Coogan's book, he lists, he lists like a bunch of other things that Joshua also does in mimicry of Moses. Interestingly enough, Moses' actions will be doubled by Joshua, um, who will in turn, you know, and, and Moses' actions will not only be doubled by Joshua, but also by Elijah. And Elijah's uh, actions, in turn, will be mimicked by his protege, Elisha. So notice how there's all this kind of replicating or doubling going on, right? Um, and what it does is that it creates a sense that these special prophetic figures, that they don't really die, per se, but continue on in their protégés or future protégés who kind of duplicate or repeat their activities, okay? Um, 
all of this duplication is kind of fun, um, at least for me. Uh, but as Coogan rightly notes, this repeating pattern, this mimicry of Joshua hints that Joshua is not really historical. Okay, um, this doesn't mean that maybe the stories of Joshua doesn't have a historical core, right? I mean, indeed, a group of people called the Israelites who claim that they are Israelites do settle in Canaan. Um, but rather that maybe Joshua doesn't really tell you exactly how things went down. Okay, and that and this idea that Joshua is not historical, but that it's literature. Okay, this is really a new understanding of Joshua for many centuries, indeed, until about the 1940s. Okay, or the really the turn of the 19th century. Um, most archaeologists believe that what the Bible describes, especially in the book of Joshua, was what really happened. Okay. Um, it was only quite recent that this was finally challenged and indeed disproven by um, archaeologists, in particular a female archaeologist named Catherine Kenyon, who looked at the destruction of Jericho, the most important kind of destruction mentioned in the book of Joshua, and found a new way to analyze the material. Okay? Before in archaeology, you would just kind of dig up whatever you found was interesting. I mean, this messed up everything. Okay? Instead, she kind of um, figures out a new way of digging in the dirt. Um, you dig a small plot of land straight down, and you know, by doing so, you can measure different layers, right, and date the different layers, okay? So, um, and, and so she kind of looked at the destruction of Jericho anew and realized that the data, right, did not match up to how it's portrayed in the biblical text, okay? Um, for more on the destruction of Jericho, uh, please turn to the next video.